But anyway, God, God could have done it in a million different ways, but they never got to see that. And so she goes now, and, and she I think she's still manipulating, but she says in verse 46 to Isaac, oh, I'm weary, I just want to die, you know, because of these, uh, these Hittite women that, that um, Esau had married. This is absolutely horrible, and, and this was wrong, and, and I'm going to die if this is the way it's going to be. We need to get... Jacob out of here and get him to marry into the kids. Remember, Isaac, no doubt, knew the story very well from Abraham's own servant. How Abraham said, put your hand under my thigh, Eliezer, and swear to me. It seems like Abraham thought he was going to die any time. But that you'll never let Isaac marry any of the daughters of the Canaanites, any of the women of this land. Never going to happen. You swear to me, you go back to my country and find him a wife. And so Isaac understood how important that was. Abraham, from his father Abraham. And for him to just sort of shrug it off with Esau was, I see, you know, it says in Hebrews, you know, that you guys are just sluggish in your faith, he says in the book of Hebrews. Isaac was sluggish, and he's like, oh, well, it uh, didn't work out, but, you know, such is life, and I still want to bless Esau. And um, in verse, in, in um, yeah, so he, she, she's able to convince him that this is absolutely needed, and it seems like Isaac has to wake up spiritually. He's like, one son's getting ready to kill my other son, and you're right. Jacob can't marry somebody from this land, and, and I need to give some leadership. I need to give some direction. And, and he seems to snap out of this sluggishness, this spiritual sleep. So then Isaac called Jacob, which I don't think happened too often. And he, number one, he blessed him. He charged him or commanded him. He said to him, Dads, understand how important you are in the success of your kid's life. And that they need to have those special moments in time where you have put a blessing on them. Whatever that is. I remember my son Nathan, he was just a go, 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 go guy. And he, he would just sort of do one harsh thing after the next that that would make his life difficult I mean he was a little guy okay hold it it's been raining we're gonna run outside it's real slippery we're gonna walk very slowly everybody understand that had all the kids yep I opened the door he ran out <laughs> hit his head right on the concrete and I had at that time a baby in this arm a baby in this arm and I looked down and just said okay you spanked yourself but when you're done get up and see you in the van and I remember telling him at that point, you know, at a very young age, it's like, when you are ready for life to not be so hard, let me know. And I said that for years, and, and, and then I didn't say it for years. And when he was 12 years old, he's like, okay, Dad, I'm ready for the talk. <laughs> and I'm like, what talk? About how life doesn't have to be so hard. And... Uh, and I just told him, man, you roll out of bed on your knees and you give God the day. You, you spend time in the word. You'll prosper in all you do. And, and whatever God speaks to you, do it. Obey it. And, um, and begin seeking God. And it's amazing. You can talk to, well, Bill Osborne, who was here. He, he was just a wild and crazy kid. And after that, he became the most calm, laid back surfer dude. Um, you ever, it was just night and day. And, uh, but he remembers that, and, and there's those times. And so I, I think that Isaac speaking into Jacob's life really didn't happen. I, I think here, this was so monumental for Isaac to step up and be a spiritual leader. And I think it was healing to, no doubt, a guy who was struggling with bitterness towards his own dad. 
uh, what a healing that would be as well. I know at dinner times, I, I said in my mind, I'm going to set a vision for who we are as a family. And I'd usually each night give a little something. And the kids started looking forward to that. And uh, we created a moment at dinner times in, in different ways. But purposefully leading your kids. And let me tell you, when they become adults, it doesn't change anything. Remember, Jacob at this time, we just saw in the last chapter that Esau was 40. And most believe it's 30 years later that he's like in his 70s now. I think uh, it, it wasn't. I, I think he was more like 52. But they're having the father uh, son talk here. So again, it, it, adult kids, it, it's not too late. But he blessed him. He commanded him. He said to him, Isaac is speaking into Jacob's life. And he says, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now, I want you to stop right there for a minute and look over to verse 6. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away and had commanded him not to take wives from there and gave him that charge to not marry the women of Canaan. Esau is observing this. Jacob's heading out and, and it, it seems like Esau's there at the sending out party. And he's seeing dad be spiritual like he hasn't seen dad be spiritual before. And he hears information. He was completely dumb to it. He had no idea that dad felt this way. He had no idea. He knew mom didn't like his wives. That, she, she's made that clear a couple of times. She did not like those daughter-in-laws, probably because of their idolatry. But here... He says to him plainly, and he says, Arise, go to Padam Aram. Now, I'm not going to take the time to make the significance, but remember back in verse 43 of chapter 27, she said, Go to Haran. That's the place we're, we're used to. So this is probably just another name for the same area there in Mesopotamia. And uh, go to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So go to uh, Grandpa Bethuel, and, uh, and you're going to go to his house. And I don't know if he even knows he's alive or not, but it would still be, he's the patriarch of that at that time. But go uh, speak to my brother Laban, and get a, a daughter from there to marry. And now we get to see the actual blessing that Isaac puts on Jacob. So really the one from the last chapter, you can sort of forget about it, um, but now he gives him the real one. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be a assembly of peoples, interesting, and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So he clearly is giving the Abrahamic blessing to Jacob and not Esau, as again had been prophesied through Rebekah when she was still pregnant, how God had made it clear the older shall serve the younger. So he clearly is saying, Jacob, you are the channel in which the Messiah is going to come and the lineage is going to carry on and he makes it abundantly clear. Now, a couple of interesting things here. First of all, in, in verse 3, may God Almighty, that's the term that Abraham and Isaac, and we'll find through the whole book of Genesis, is the name of God to them, which is El Shaddai, God Almighty. And that's what we mainly see in Genesis, chapter 17, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 3, chapter 35, verse 11, chapter 43, verse 17, chapter 48, verse 3, El Shaddai, God Almighty, God, uh, the powerful one. Um, that's who they knew him by. Now, interesting, in chapter 49, 25, he actually explains this. 
He says in Genesis 49:25, almost the end of the book of Genesis, by the God L of your father who has helped you, and by the Almighty Shaddai, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, and blessings of the breast of the womb. So in giving the blessings, he says, we know God, El, and we know he's our almighty Shaddai. And that's what they had mainly known. But yet we're going to see even tonight, when God reveals himself, he says, I'm the Lord, period. He just says, I'm Yahweh. He, it's the Tetragrammaton, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yah or Yahweh, uh, Y-H-W-H. And really that is the name of God we're going to discover because it, later on when Moses now is sort of rediscovering God for the first time, he had a very much a heart for God up to 40 and, and, and thought he was doing God's work by killing the Egyptian and had to flee for 40 years. And, and when God comes to him and, and he basically is, you know, looking at the burning bush, and in Exodus 6, 2, it says, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord, Yahweh, Yah. And then in verse 3, he says it plainly. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. So they knew the Annunciation. They used the name because God revealed it, but they had no idea really what it had meant. And of course, in that passage and on through the Bible, we, we learn, number one, is Jesus. Um, secondly, we, we learn that it is, I'm the God, whatever you need. I am that I am. But, so it's interesting here that he does make it clear. It's, it's El Shaddai that has blessed you, make you fruitful, multiply you. But then he says something very interesting, very different than the other times God had spoke this blessing. He said that you may be in assemblies of people. Now, the Greek Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that happened in 250 B.C. The Greek word here is the word synagogue, synagogue. This is the first use of that word in the Bible. And, of course, at this time, they didn't have a synagogue. <laughs> um, God never really set up the synagogue. But it is the word assembly. Now, if you ask yourself, in the New Testament, what would be an equivalence of assembly? And interesting, the word church, the first meaning of it is assembly. It literally means bring, coming out of your home into public. Synagogue means that, and the word church means that. Come out of your home and meet in public. Interesting, because we're doing a lot of live streaming right now, and you're not going to church. Um, now, I understand people are sick or, you know, they don't like to drive at night, which you're not doing it here at our church anyway right now in the summertime. But, um, but it is interesting that he says assembly of peoples, because earlier he says you'll be a nation's. I'll bless you, and, and you'll be, you're going to make nations. And then eventually you're going to bless uh, all the families of the earth. But for some reason here, Isaac deviates from that. Very clearly, he is being led by the Holy Spirit to say the ultimate plan in blessing you is to bring about a group of peoples, which is, again, referring to other nations, not just Jews, to be an assembly. So many think here that this is the first mention of the church. Now, when we come to the New Testament, the first time the word church is ever used is in Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus says, and I will build my church. That's the first time. 
And every time Jesus talked about the assembly, he used the word church. In the Greek, that's ekklesia. You guys know that word, right? The called out ones. There were other words they could have used, but that was the word that was chosen by Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones, just like the Jews. They were called out of Mesopotamia to the promised land. So the church is called out of their darkness into the marvelous light. And they're in assemblies of people. Jesus goes to synagogue to teach. Jesus enters synagogues at times. But when he teaches and he wants to talk about assembly, he says ecclesia, the church. And so here, some think this is a prophecy in Acts chapter 2, remember, of all the peoples, of all the tongues, uh, of all the different nations come together, and they start speaking in tongues, and everybody understands them in their own languages. Wow, a lot of interesting things here, but he does change it from nations uh, in in chapter 12, verse 2, as uh, God spoke to Abraham there, I will make you a great nation, And I will bless you. Here he doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to make you an assemblies of people. And then um, in verse 5, so Isaac uh, sent Jacob away, and he went to Padam Haram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian. We talked about that before. Armenian uh, is is probably better. We we talked about that in earlier passages. The King James only translates it that way. The brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau, in verse 6, he saw that Isaac blessed Jacob. So this, this must have been shocking. Hey, be there, we're all going to send Jacob away. He's going to go see the family. And then Esau is standing there, and he's watching this. And I mean, what I can understand here in the text, in context, he was amazed. He was taken back by this. It was like, whoa, Um, now there's a blessing. (laughs) And my dad just put it on my brother Jacob. And then he sent him away and he takes, and uh, to take for himself a wife from there and that he blessed him and gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. So it seems to have gone deep, cutting into Esau. And that Jacob had, and it says, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padam Haram. So it appears here that Esau is observing this going, this was a big ask. Asking Jacob to leave his mother and, and, and so forth. Wow. And Esau is observing this going, wow, this, the whole thing, Jacob actually doing it and going all the way there and what mom and dad are thinking and what dad said. So he he responds to this. Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. Now earlier we know it didn't please his mother twice. We talked about this, but now he sees for the first time, this didn't please my dad. I didn't know that. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahaloth, the daughter of Ishmael. So maybe he's thinking, okay, well, I don't have to go all the way back there to get one of Abraham's descendants or one of Abraham's kids to marry into the family. I'll just go short little distance and there's some of Ishmael's relatives. Hey, you know, you got, isn't that the same thing? Maybe he was thinking that. Interesting, it just seems that he is completely clueless. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. He just doesn't have a brain, a spirit, uh, an ability to to discern what is the will of God. So now some say, on the other hand, that at this point Esau gets bitter at Isaac for all of this. And to just sort of double down and say, well, you think it was, you know, grievous when I married those two guys. I'm going to go find somebody that will really grieve you, mom and dad. Some of the, the commentators see it that way. I, I don't. I just think he's, he's just a big, dumb clod. And he's thinking, trying to think spiritually, but he doesn't have the, the ability to do that. So he's thinking, oh, okay, this, this child of Ishmael, he's Abraham's son. And one of the, you know, it's a part of the family. It's the same thing. That'll bless them. 
So he goes and does that, and that's the sister of Nabojoth, and to be his wife, in addition to the wives he already had. So he's building a harem. Well, back to Jacob now, and we're going to be with him for several weeks. Now, Jacob went out from Beersheba. We're familiar with that place, right? Um, the seven wells, or the wells of the oath, and went towards Haran. So he's heading that direction, and he came to a certain place. Interesting, in the Hebrew, it's very clear, it's the place. He went to the certain place, not a certain place, but it's understanding why they translate it that way. But he clearly went to the place that God had in mind. And he stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one uh, of the stones that was in that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. So I guess this was sort of the custom. These guys were rock hard, solid dudes, man. And I, can, you know, I don't need no pillow, just give me a rock. I, I guess maybe that was, what's that? Yeah, these guys, are, these guys are tough dudes, man. Well, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached into heaven, and there were angels of God that were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord, notice Yahweh, stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. Abraham, your father, and a God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. Sometimes God said stars of the heaven. Sometimes he said the sand on the seashores, and now he says the dust of the earth. It's not the first, first time he said it. It's going to be a lot of numbers, the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we're going to find out this place is Bethel. We've been talking about the name. It actually doesn't get named until this chapter, even though we saw the name hundreds of years earlier. Um, and... Bethel, if you picture Jerusalem, it's just a little ways north, not very far from Jerusalem. And when you think about Bethel, it's sort of in the center of the country. So it is a really good place for God to say, look all four directions. Because uh, as far as you can see, that's going to be your place. Now, Bethel had already become a very special place for Abraham. Remember in chapter 12, when Abraham first gets to the promised land, um, in chapter 12, verse 8, it says that he stopped near Bethel, and that's where he put his tent between Bethel and Ai, the house of God, and Ai, the heap of ruins, and he built an altar and he worshiped. He pitched his tent, just like we are. We're between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, the heap of runes. And, uh, and we just pitch our tent there and, uh, and make an altar and worship. And then later on, in chapter 13, Abraham comes back to that same location. And God speaks to Abraham twice there at Bethel. So this has been sort of a place, but Abr you know, Isaac, like I said, was spiritually sluggish, and he didn't pass on any of the rich uh, history that had happened along the way. You think it's like, hey, did you know God spoke to Abraham eight times, son? Let me tell you about the first time God spoke to Abraham. Let me tell you about the second. He didn't do that. Isaac, God only speaks to him twice. Um, and here with Jacob, God is directly talking to him at this place. First of all, we see a ladder appear. And then he notices angels going up and down both directions. And then at the top of the ladder, there is this person. And he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land that lies before you, I'm going to give to your descendants. So God is speaking directly to Jacob for the first time in a dream, interesting enough. Now, what's awesome about this is theologians 
for the next 3,000 years are going to be scratching their head going, what in the world does that mean? You know, uh, Jacob's going to wake up going, hey, I think I accidentally came into some kind of, you know, spiritual thing here, you know, and I think I'm in the house of God and I end up walking through some door I didn't see and I lay down in the middle of this temple that I can't see and, and it's God's house and, you know, he's thinking in this mystical way. But it's interesting that the next time we hear about this is in John chapter 1, verse 51. And this is where Jesus is just being introduced to his 12 apostles. They haven't even been chosen all yet. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is saying, I'm the latter. It's me. Later in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember that track for spiritual laws? Man, I handed out thousands of those through high school and college. And, but the thing I loved about that, at one point, they show man over here, and they show heaven over here, and there's this big chasm. And they then make a bridge, looks sort of like a ladder, saying, how do you get from one side to the other? And you explain to him, it only goes through Christ. And here Jesus is saying, you're, you're going to get it. In other words, these, these apostles are going, who are you? You're a carpenter from Nazareth, and can anything good come out of Nazareth? And, and, and he says to Nathaniel, hey, um, while you were sitting under the fig tree, I saw you. And it's like, whoa, okay, who are you talking to? He goes, you think that's something? You're going to see angels ascending and descending. Well, I know that's upon me. Whoa. Okay, I'm starting to realize what's happening here. That Jesus is the ladder between God and man. And, and here, God now just pours it on Jacob. I love this. He says, behold, I think that probably had a booming, you know, voice. I am with you. I will keep you. When it says the Lord's our keeper, it means protector. He's our bodyguard, literally. I'm your bodyguard. Wherever you go, I'm going to be there and will bring you back to this land. And I will not leave you until I have done what I've spoken to you. Wow, Jacob by himself, probably for the first time in his life, he's on this journey, there's a million things that can go bad. He's now up on this very desolate place and he doesn't sound like he's really sufficiently prepared for this trip. And he, he's using this rock as his pillow and God just comes and says, it's me, I'm Yahweh. And just like I was with Abraham, just like I was with your father Isaac, now it's you, Jacob. And he puts the Abrahamic blessing upon him. And then he gets specific, I think, right to the very loneliness, right to the very hurt, right to the very hole uh, of Jacob's heart. You're not alone. I'm going to be with you. You're not unprotected. I'm your protector. And you know what? You're not going to get away from me. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. Boy, isn't that wonderful? The Lord has us in his hand, doesn't he? He won't let us go. And I am going to bring you back. It's going to happen. Just like your dad and Abraham, I told them I would. I'm going to be faithful to you and bring you back. And then I'm going to do everything I said until it's done. Um, I'm going to complete it. I'm going to complete that work. Later on, to the whole nation of Israel, God would say something similar to this in Deuteronomy 7, 9. Therefore, know the Lord your God. He is God faithful, God who keeps covenants and mercy for thousands of generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Of course, I think the promises 
All the promises of God are yea and amen to us, but I think the promises of God in the New Testament are far greater. In Philippians 1.6, I'm confident this very thing, he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Very similar here, isn't it? He says there, I'm not going to leave you until that work is done. Matthew 28, 20, of course, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But I think of that great promise that God speaks to the whole nation of Israel, but uses Jacob as an example, really speaking to all of them, not individually about Jacob, but using Jacob as a name for the nation. And he says, Isaiah 43, 1, but now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And of course, in the New Testament, God's promise to us makes Isaiah 43 uh, look like nothing. Look in, in Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Wow, far, far greater. So again, understanding election and predestination, just real quick. God predestined before time that those who believe in the Messiah by faith alone, not of our works, not of ourselves, but a gift from God, will become the elect. So whoever believes on the Messiah, has faith in the Messiah, receives the Messiah, will become the elect. And he's predestined that everyone who's the elect, God's predestined good works that they should walk in them. And God's predestined that we will be in the image of the Son. So Jesus on the cross, it says in Hebrews 10, 14, that through the one sacrifice, he has perfected forever that's justification, those he's now sanctifying. On the cross was the complete work of justification, but also the complete work of sanctification. So we are going to be in heaven in our brand new bodies, perfect in righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us will become the righteousness of Christ. That's going to be done. But it's this time right now between the date not being just born, but born again, till the date we leave this body through dying or being raptured, it's that time in between, it's a vapor of time, that God is sanctifying us. And that's where we play a part in that. If we're willing to obey, willing to submit, God is going to cause us to bear much fruit. But even if we don't, there's just blessings God's going to put on our life either way. And this is what we see. God says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to get from point A to point B, um, you know, whether I got to drag you or not, <laughs> whether I got to get you to the pig pen and you come running out of that pig pen home. Either way, I, my hand's on you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I am going to complete that good work in you. I don't know how much will happen on this earth before you. I do it in heaven, but hopefully a long ways. And, and all, the, all the sanctification we take part in is our rewards in heaven. So if we fight temptation, there's crowns. There seems to be many crowns that we'll be receiving. And, and there'll be an eternal blessing if we take part in the sanctification and, uh, and follow the Lord and obey the Lord. But there's a certain degree that God has predestined that he's just going to put his hand and make the blessings come, whether we're walking in obedience or not. He's going to protect us and he's going to keep us. He's going to be with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Wherever we go, he's going to be with us. He is going to finish that good work with us or without us. He's going to be faithful because uh, he, he cannot deny himself even when we're unfaithful. Well, in verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord, Yahweh, is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid. He felt the awe of God, the presence of God, and said, how awesome 
Let me tell you that word awesome, it does tie back to the presence of God only. So I don't care how good the apple pie is, it's not awesome. (laughs) Only God is awesome. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the, the gate of heaven. So Jacob is just spiritually not very mature. Isaac did not disciple him. Remember when Jacob went deceiving his father and pretended to be Esau. He's like, well, how did you get the kill so quick? And he said, oh, your God blessed me. He didn't say my God. And it doesn't seem that he has that relationship to Isaac's failure. And he woke up and and, and in his mind, he's like, it's the location. This is a special place. He's going to mark it, make sure he can get back in that house later if he needs to. But God, he didn't understand. Wherever you go, Jacob, is going to be Bethel. Wherever you go, I am there. It's not about a certain location. It's about me being in your life. David had a revelation moment like that too. In Psalms 139, verse 7 through 12, we know it well. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. Well, that's, that's sort of common knowledge. But if I made my bed in hell, behold, you are there. So two crazy extremes. God's in all the extremes and everything in between. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost part of the sea, which happened to Jonah later, Even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Sure was true for Jonah. And if you surely, the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be like light around me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, and the darkness is light. Both are a light to you. Boy, here he's he's coming to understand, and he's going to get it later and understand that God is with him wherever he goes. And God's presence is this powerful. And angels are around about. You're unaware of it. You can't see it. But it's there. Hebrews says, be careful who you're entertaining. You might be talking to an angel and you should have caught that. You don't, don't let that get past you next time. But the re- reality is, is, is we are here. When we gather together in his name, two or three, he is here. This is Bethel. This is the house of God. This is the place where the Lord wants to meet us as we meet him. Well, in verse 18, Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put on his, under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. Now, if you're from back south, you're going, yeah, of course he set it up as a pillow. Pillar, you know. Hey, how many pillars do you want for your bed tonight? No, no, that's a different word altogether. That's pillow in California. We say it that way. But back south, they say pillar. He set up his pillar. Of course he did. He slept on it. Well, no, that's not what that means here. Um, He set it up sort of as a monument to mark that location. And then he poured oil on top of it. Interesting. We see these things that they did, and I don't think they understood it. But at the same time, it's representing the work of the Holy Spirit. And he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city had been Luz previously. So the pagans had called it Luz, and it was that for a long time until eventually Israel became a country there, and they no longer called it Luz, but Bethel. But then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this place and I'm going and give bread to me to eat and clothing to put on and I will come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Now understand here, the word if is a preposition can also be since. And it seems that it's not a question. Some are going, well, if God does this, then I guess I will let him be my God. I don't think that's what's happening here because he made a vow. And the vow is, since God is going to be with me. He just said that. He just told me that. Since he's going to keep me in this way. He just told me that. That I am going. I, and give me the bread to eat and clothing to put on. He said he's going to take care of me and bring me back. And I'm going to come back to my father's house in peace. 
then the Lord shall be my God. So yes, th this, is, this is something that could materialize and be real. And then this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth, or the word tithe, to you. So going back to what Abraham had done. And understanding, giving the tithe or giving the offering, it, it was basically signifying that everything I have is God's. So they had to give the first of their increase, the first of their crops, the first of their sheep. They had to give their firstborn son. All of these things saying, my first son and all the kids after that. The, the first of my crop because all my crop is yours. The first of my increase because everything I have is yours. That's, that's the, the deep signifying understanding of that tithe. But again, this is before the law. There was no command from God coming up with this percentage going, uh, 10%, put that down, Moses. No, this, this happened in their hearts. This is something God's spirit put upon their hearts before there ever was a law. But then it was in the law. But then after the law, Jesus, we talked about it this last Sunday at the end of Philippians 4, where Jesus said, you guys are setting aside mercy and justice and the love of God, and you're spending so much time on all your tithing, on all your little tiny little BBs of, of mint and rue. And, and he said, this you should do this you must do, referring to the tithing in, in the grammar of that sentence, without leaving the other undone. So it, it's both, and we see that here as well. Now, I just want to ask a question as we finish up here. What is it that Abraham did, Isaac did, Jacob did, that caused God to bless them so greatly? What is it that they did? The answer is nothing. <laughs> God called them. God sought them out. God blessed them in spite of them being agents a big part of the time. And again, he comes to Abraham and says, hey, Abraham, you're, you may look like you don't have any kids, but I've already seen it. You've got his kids as many as the stars of the heavens. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And this is what we're seeing here now with Jacob. It's, it's very minimal. We're going to see later on when God meets him again. It's very substantial. And God changes his name to Israel, one being governed by God. In John 1, 12, again, it says, As many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. What are we receiving mainly? He told us in John 1, 14 and 16, it's grace of his fullness. We all receive grace upon grace. He says in John, just a couple of verses after this, of his fullness. It, it's, it's hard to realize I am such a sinner. I'm not doing the things that you should bless me. I'm not saying the right things. I don't have the right attitude. There's some character flaws that are so huge. I am not the kind of thing that a good person would want to be around. I'm not the kind of person that a good person would want to give to. I'm not the kind of person that a good God would want to give eternal blessings to. I'm not that person. Well, that's where the faith comes in, isn't it? faith believing in the grace of God that he's bestowing it on us even though we have done nothing to deserve it right it's not of ourselves you know we read we say that verse in Ephesians 2 8 and 9 we are saved by grace through faith having faith in the grace it's not of ourself I think that's the most important thing we we often say not of works lest anyone else should boast but I think the most important thing is not of yourself. It's not of a past self or a present self or a future self. Often people say, okay, I'll receive God's goodness, but I'm going to make up for it. He's going to see me down the line and he's going to go, yep, yep, I, I knew you'd make, I know you knew you'd balance the scales by giving back to me. Um, and so I sort of put an upfront uh, amount of money to our upfront blessing because I knew eventually you'd pay me back. No, it's, it's it, by faith, it's not of ourself. 
It's simply because he set his love upon us. And it's so important to understand God loves the whole world. As many who will just have faith and say, even though I'm a Jacob, (laughs) even though I'm a hill catcher, even though I'm a con man and a deviant guy, you come to me in your loving kindness and tender mercies. Bring me to repentance. When I'm not faithful, I don't doubt because I know your nature and that when I'm not faithful, you remain faithful because that's who you are. And so we just come to know the God of all grace who comforts us and encourages us. You know, Acts 16, 31, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Can you believe in that kind of God that loves you, that wants to give to you? Nothing you've done or ever could do is good enough to receive that blessing. But God so loves the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we are seeing here God, especially Jacob, he is a turkey. (laughs) He's done nothing but very off, weird, strange things. All he is, all we see of Jacob to this point is a guy who has a horrible character and you wouldn't trust him with anything. He, he is one guy you want to stay clear of. But yet, God says, this, these people are example, all the Old Testament things are an example for us who now at the end times have as our examples to believe. So Lord, thank you, God, for your word tonight. And we thank you, God, if we're feeling lonely, Lord, if we're feeling like we're by ourselves without any strength, if we feel that we're at the end of ourselves, um, all we have is a rock to to comfort us. Um, We're just sort of stuck between a hard place and a difficult time in our life that we would come Remember all the promises of God are yea and amen. That what you would do for Jacob, you would do for the whole world. And that your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is now to us. We're now the kids. All those who have the faith of Abraham are children of Abraham. And we thank you now that you are coming with 10 million times greater blessings in the New Testament where you make it clear that you bore our sins, that we could become the righteousness of Christ. That, lo, you are with us always to the very end of the age. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You'll be finished that work you started until the very day we see you face to face, Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask tonight that you would give us great encouragement in our souls in your nature in your heart, in your love, in your grace, in your mercy. In Jesus' name, Lord. Sing a song.